On 20 November, United Nations forces are advancing everywhere in North Korea and have reached the Manchurian border at Haisan Jin, as Chinese Reds, who entered the fighting three weeks previously, have suddenly withdrawn. On 24 November, General Douglas MacArthur launches a major assault in the Western sector in a movement designed to end the war in Korea, barring full-scale intervention by the Chinese Communists. By 28 November, the Chinese Communists have again entered the fighting in far greater force than they did a month previously. This halts the UN general assault and drives UN troops back, especially on the right flank of the Western Line, where South Korean resistance is crumbling. By 4 December, Chinese Communists have driven a wedge between the US 8th Army in the West and the 10th Corps in the East, with the 8th Army retreating toward Pyongyang and part of the 10th Corps fighting its way out of a trap near the Changjin Reservoir. By 20 December, Chinese Communists and regrouped North Koreans have driven UN forces to the 38th parallel in the West. In the East, US Marines and 7th Division troops have fought their way out of the Red Trap and are being evacuated by ship at Hung Nam, with other UN troops fighting bitterly to hold the perimeter until the evacuation is completed. After the tanks have spearheaded through to the border near Haisan Jin, the men of the U.S. 7th Division come in to take over. It is bitter cold in the valleys as they advance doggedly across the snow patches. It is even colder as they ascend the slopes, and it is tougher going up. The frozen ground offers little in the way of footholds. Fortunately, there is not much opposition from the enemy. Our planes help take care of that. One good thing, they are advancing. It is a tough, climbing job but they are going forward. Slowly but steadily, they are coming closer and closer to their objective, the south bank of the Yellow River on the Manchurian border. At this time, it appears that reaching the border will be the beginning of the end of the war in Korea, and the men are anxious to get to their objective. Finally, they see it stretching out in front of them, the Yellow River frozen over completely, and the Korean town of Haisan Jin nestling in the snow-patched valley. Thanksgiving dinner, turkey with all the trimmings, and served piping hot is a pleasant interlude. It brings a touch of home to the icy wastes of Korea. The machine gun crews crouched in the outposts overlooking the vast icy stretch of the Yellow River are not forgotten. The mess sergeant brings Thanksgiving to them too. Hot chow that hits the right spot when it's so cold. With turkey and mashed potatoes in extra large portions. But Thanksgiving peace doesn't last long. The Chinese hordes attack suddenly, crossing the ice on the yellow in ever-increasing numbers. Many of them surrender. At the Changjin Reservoir, the men of the 1st Marine Division and the 7th Infantry Division find themselves trapped by 10 Communist divisions. That's when the withdrawal is ordered. Retreat? Hell, snapped one Marine commander. We're not retreating, we're just advancing in a different direction. Orders are issued for all the troops to assemble at Hagaru. This time their objective is to break through and reach Hung Nam on the coast 60 miles away. Through howling winds and icy blasts of snow, preparations are made for an orderly withdrawal. Back across the frozen valleys, which they had fought so hard to capture, it was tough enough when they were advancing. It was far worse to have to pull back. They are already tired, cold, and weary as they move into the assembly area, but they know they will fight their way out of the trap. Even the heaviest of armor and tanks are to be taken back.
There are casualties as much from the cold as from sniper's bullets. The wounded are carried along. The dead are buried. But the assembly for the withdrawal continues unabated. Food and supplies are airdropped from C-47s and C-119s by the 21st Troop Carrier Squadron of the Combat Cargo Command. Ammunition, medical supplies, and food are dropped. No matter how cold and tired they may feel on the ground, the sight of these cargo planes dropping their parachute loads from the skies gives the men a sense of not being forgotten, a feeling that they are still part of a vast team fighting together. Meanwhile, preparations for the long, hazardous move progress. All excess equipment is burned or destroyed. They make sure that nothing will be left that the enemy can make use of. Trucks, jeeps, everything and anything that is mobile that can move under its own power is saved. The enemy will find, when they take over, only ruined earth and charred remains. Thousands of battle casualties and frostbite victims are evacuated from the emergency fields at Hagaru and Koto and flown here to the Yanpo airfield near Hongnam, where they are transferred to hospital planes for the trip to Japan. They will soon find themselves warm and well cared for. Many of these men suffered their wounds during the withdrawal from the Changjin Reservoir but none were left behind to the communists. Those still fighting along the snow-covered passes of the North Korean mountains face a tough battle before they can reach the comparative safety of Hung Nam. With only short pauses at Hagaru, near the Changjin Reservoir, and Koto, 10 miles south, the steady push to safety continues. Chinese prisoners, captured by patrols, are carried along on the withdrawal for whatever information they may furnish G2. In contrast to the North Korean prisoners, these Chinese are much better equipped and more warmly clad. The Marines have a bitter march ahead. It's 44 miles to Hung Nam. The road winds through some of the roughest fighting terrain in the world. In the history of the U.S. Marine Corps, this march will stand as one of its most valiant battles. Twisting icy roads, snowstorms, below zero cold. General Winter is allied with the Chinese in this operation. While the convoys are moving east, rear guard units are still fighting to hold back the Chinese hordes near Hagaru. Many vehicles break down and are abandoned. The engineers work constantly to make the road passable. Bridges dropped by air are built ahead of the column. These desperately tired men inch their way along until they reach the little settlement of Koto. They join 3,000 more Marines, but there is little rest here. The Chinese wave is still sweeping down from the north, and a few hours rest may mean annihilation. Mile by heartbreaking mile, each hour is endless. 
The cold numbs the mind to everything but the next turn in the road. Then slowly, these weary men realize there is less snow around them. They have reached the foot of the mountains. They are near the sea. Thirteen days after the march from Hagaru, the Marines meet the protection of the U.S. 3rd Division on the outskirts of Ham Hung. Ham Hung is a twin city to Hung Nam, one of the largest seaports on the Korean East Coast. At Hung Nam, preparations are underway for the largest amphibious evacuation in military history. Everything of military value in the cities of Ham Hung and Hung Nam is to be carried away or destroyed. Huge shipments of military equipment had poured into the area for weeks to supply the expected victory march to the Manchurian border. Now these supplies, sent here to support the whole 10th Corps, are piled up and carried out to the transports again. Headquarters equipment, rehabilitation supplies, everything goes as Korean civilians pitch in to help. Most of the Korean population is hoping there will be shipping space for them to go too. The vast quantity of equipment that is being moved here is more easily comprehended when you think of the units involved. The 10th Corps that is being evacuated includes three full U.S. divisions. 1st Marine Division, the 3rd Infantry Division, and the 7th Infantry Division, plus thousands of South Korean troops. The personnel involved in this move is equal to the entire population of Dayton, Ohio. Over 100,000 civilian refugees from the Hung Nam area are taken to freedom along with the troops, but thousands must be left behind to the uncertain mercy of the communists. Refugees pour down to the docks until every available ship is jammed. Their eagerness to abandon their homes and possessions is pitiful proof of their fear of the communist regime. These people who have known red domination give dramatic evidence that they have had enough. Every effort is made to evacuate as many as possible to the Pusan area. Pusan is already swarming with hundreds of thousands of refugees who have fled from other parts of Korea. This huge migration poses a major problem to UN authorities. Loaded down with their few belongings, or a baby, the refugees push forward to the ships. The Hungnam evacuation entails the movement of 105,000 soldiers, 17,500 vehicles, and 350,000 tons of equipment. The communists, whose supply lines from Manchuria are under constant attack by our planes, will sorely miss this huge haul of military equipment, which so nearly fell to them as a prize of war. Rear guard troops hold fast on the shrinking perimeter of the beachhead with the support of naval guns from the harbor. And this valuable material is saved for other battles. With the United States 3rd Division fighting the principal holding action, the rest of the 10th Corps is taken aboard the evacuation ships. The 3rd Division had been fighting to the south of the Marines in the original advance to the border. In spite of the apparent turmoil, the troop evacuation is calm and orderly. The removal of the wounded has first priority. Although the more serious cases have been loaded on earlier ships or taken out by air, casualties keep coming in from the defense perimeter. In spite of the fact that our forces are greatly outnumbered, the cost in casualties is much lighter than for a comparable time during the summer defense of the Pusan beachhead.
Landing craft form an endless conveyor belt running from the docks to the transports waiting in the harbor. It takes a lot of boatloads to carry 100,000 soldiers. On hand to receive the 10th Corps troops is a large U.S. Navy amphibious fleet commanded by Rear Admiral Doyle. The guns of the 7th Fleet under Vice Admiral Struble support the evacuation. This redeployment of an entire Army Corps by sea has never been attempted before. But the U.S. forces, pioneers in mass beachhead operations, simply take their well-perfected amphibious landing techniques and work them in reverse. The evacuation begun on 12 December is well along by the 20th of the month. The gallant fighting force, which fought its way to the coast against tremendous odds, takes leave of northern Korea but the red aggressors will be meeting them again. <laughs>